Hey everybody, this is WMAX Boston powerhouse radio personality, Jimmy J. I want to introduce you to an exciting and informative podcast about a great sport I've always loved, harness racing. I've been to the track many times and I'm a big fan. This broadcast focuses on horse racing integrity and many other important facts of the sport. Now, here it is, the Harness Racing Alumni Show with your host, Freddie Hudson and Trey Martin. Thank you, Jimmy J, for that great introduction. That is the one and only Jimmy J. He is known worldwide as the voice of the stars. He's got one of the best voices on radio. He's a good buddy of mine, and it was pretty expensive to get him, too. Let's go on from there. (laughs) Okay. Hi. Now, I'm Freddie Hudson. I'm here with my uh, co-hosts, Trey Martin and Bob Marks. And on today's show, we will be discussing the Horse Racing Integrity Act with Sean Smealy. The bill was just recently introduced to Congress by Congressman Barr of Kentucky and Tonko of New York. But before we start, let me give you a little background on our special guest. Sean is one of D.C.'s top lobbyists. He was a special assistant to President George H.W. Bush, and he is the founder of the Coalition of Horse Race and Integrity. Welcome on the show, Sean. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we're going to ask you a series of six questions, and after each question, either Bob or Trey will have a comment or question. John, why is the Horse Race and Integrity Act necessary? It's necessary because uh, right now racing um, is in 38 different jurisdictions across the country, and each one has their own way of providing, you know, of, of, of providing anti-doping uh, regulation, and as a result, um, it's very uneven around the country, and and trainers and others are able to kind of game the system. It's also very frustrating because maybe not so much in harness racing, but certainly in thoroughbred racing, a lot of horses cross state lines to run. Every every thoroughbred horse runs at least once across state line, um, and as you all know, the, the most of the handle is a cross state line. Ninety percent of all of the handle in racing is is a cross state line. So it's very much of an interstate game. But unfortunately, the the, the anti doping rules have not kept up. And uh, what you'll see, for example, out in California, one of the critical aspects of any solid uh, and effective anti doping program is out of comp- out of competition testing. And California has been one of the leaders in that. But even California, it took them five years to get that rule to increase out-of-competition testing um, uh, through their regulatory process. Um, uh, as a way of example, for, for Olympic athletes, 60% of all testing um, is done out-of-competition. Only 40% is done at or after an event. Okay, um, In horse racing right now, Nationwide, 1% of testing is done out of competition. When you say out of competition, just describe that for me. What do you, what do you mean? Yeah, so what happens when... is, so in the Olympic world, for example, the athletes have to let the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, which is responsible for all U.S. Olympic and elite athletes uh, testing, they have to let them know where they're training at all times. Okay, uh, and so you know, for for example, bicycling, they could be training over in Spain or somewhere else, right? And they have to be available for somebody to come and test them uh, at a moment's notice. Sean, with the racehorses, basically the commission, at least in New Jersey where I am, and I believe in Pennsylvania too, they have the right to come into your barn and search your barn and also test your horses anytime they want. So they have the right, but they're not doing it. That's the problem, right? And well, so, the enforcement of the law is the whole thing. It's the same as the gun laws. It's not in, uh, Things are not enforced. There's so many laws, but nobody that, enforces them. It's when, and, that, and, and that raises a great point about the, 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 the laws because um, enforcement of even the state, the lax state laws, is an issue because um, you know because it, these these are not independent racing commissioners. You know they can in a lot of states, it's people that could have a financial interest in the game. So right. the independence is always called into question. Also, it's a it's you know it's a it's a it's a game where people know each other, right? And so how likely is a commissioner to to want to really punish a cheater? If they, you know, have drinks with them at night. Absolutely, Absolutely. So. yeah. Okay, mo- moving on to question number two. How would the Horse Racing Integrity Act impact harness racing 
differently than the thoroughbred racing industry? You know, that's a great question. Um, there's been criticism from the harness uh, industry um, representatives and the quarter horse industry is that it's a, it would be a cookie cutter approach from the, the horse anti-doping authority, right? That's envisioned in the legislation, and um, that 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 is couldn't be further from the truth. The the um, U, the U.S. anti-doping agency, which will compound the majority of the board of the Horse Anti-Doping Authority um, has a track record of working with different sports um, uh, around the you know around the globe, frankly, and how they they have different needs. An example is when they were putting the World Anti-Doping Code together back in the mid 2000s. Marijuana, for example, was a big issue, uh, and they knew that some sports marijuana uh, was more critical uh, and needed to be regulated than other sports, right? And as a result, they, you know, for different sports, they had different threshold levels. And I think, you know, I know in harness racing, you know, um, you know, painkillers is a, a little bit more of necessity uh, than it is maybe in the thoroughbred horse racing world because you run more often, correct? So uh, I think the, I think Travis Tigert, who is the CEO of USADA, has said, you know, we're going to look at each sport and their needs differently, just like we do within the, the human uh, athletes world. So right. each breed will have to make a case of why they want this or that, but um, he's not going to just say, well, whatever's good for thoroughbred horse racing is good for the rest of the breeds. You know, Sean, it's not your fault, but what's bothering me is the term doping. Uh, you know, who came up with that term doping? I mean, nobody's doping any horses. Doping means... To me, it means somebody who's drunk, who's on, who's on, you know, like who's on pot, who's on uh, heroin or something like that. That's doping. I mean, we're we're talking about drug enhancement of horses or uh, painkillers for horses, and or the, you know, I mean, we of course get the Lasix, uh, you know, which is a diuretic. But uh, doping is not a good word for the act. You know, just like I love Horse Racing Integrity Act. I mean, that sounds really classy. But when I hear doping, boy, that really bothers me as a horseman and also as a as a fan of the racing thing. Yes, but let let me let me go at that one statement. H how do you know? Okay. You don't know, right? Because uh, I've always said, if you know when you're going to be tested, if you know what pretty much they're testing for, and you know that the labs they're sending the test to are not internationally accredited as most of them are not, then there's a greater incentive for the less savory of trainers to cheat. And what we found in human athletes is if there's not strong oversight on all testing and doping, etc., cetera, um, athletes like trainers will say, well, I know this trainer X is cheating. I better start doing something too just to stay competitive. And it's like a, a nuclear arms race, right? I'm talking about the word doping. If you dope somebody, that means you maybe want them to finish last or finish out of the money. But to me, the doping word bothers me. But that's just me. I understand well, about the testing and stuff like that. And some people in the industry have, I think we'd, we'd be sticking our heads in the sand to say that under the current system, which is very lax and very convoluted, that there isn't doping going on. And you see in the thoroughbred horse racing, you're starting to see these trainers at you know 35%, 40% winning percentages. As you know, 10 years ago, if you had a 20% winning chances, you were guaranteed a spot in the Hall of Fame. I mean, just on empirical evidence alone, something's going on. Oh, there's no doubt about it, but it's mostly the use of EPO, though. Listen, I don't want to get into this now because yeah. Freddie's got another question for you, but you guys move on. Our next question, if the Horse Racing Integrity Act was in place, would it have reduced the uh, recent spat of um, injuries and deaths at Santa Anita? Yes, no doubt, and here's why. If these horses are tested out of competition, right, um, mm -hmm. horses that are in training, which were most of the deaths, but most of the 23 deaths were horses that were training, not running race day. You would have better control of how often these horses are getting painkillers, right? And as uh, in a thoroughbred, maybe not so much in the, in the standard bred, but in the thoroughbred world, and especially in California, those trainers train those horses very hard. In fact, I saw one figure that said California trainers work their horses out two and a half times more than New York horses. And so if you're not, if you're not regulating the, the use of painkillers when they're not 
ready to run and they're between runs, you have a greater risk of horses thinking they're healthy and running faster than they should be. Mm -hmm. And so there's no doubt in my mind and most of the industry mind that that is a contributing cause. Is it the cause? I would say looking at it, there was something definitely going on with that track. But the fact that these horses had no regulations on how much painkillers they were getting, whatever it be, butte or whatever, had to be a very strong contributing factor. I'm going to add something in here because I just read it in the Pollock report today. Since the Stonish Group implemented the new rules, and there has not been an incident since March 31st, and I think that's a positive step. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Just to add one more thing is, if it's good for horses in California, why wouldn't it be good for horses across the country? Most of the things the Stronach Group implemented there are actually in our bill, and in fact, they added some more. So to me, you know, opposing the bill basically says, well, we, we want two standards, a safety standard for California that doesn't apply for the rest of the country. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Please go to the next question, Freddie. Why use the U.S. Uh, Anti-Doping Agency? What do they know about horse racing? Well, here's the important thing to know about the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. They, they will never know as much about horse racing as you all will. But what they are experts in and that you and the industry will never be experts in is how to run an effective anti-doping organization. Okay, and, and when it comes to anti-doping, it's all about the procedures you put in place, uh, making sure the labs uh, are up to code and up to standard, making sure that the people that are involved in the testing have no involvement in racing itself, no financial involvement. So right. it's making sure that you have uniformity and independence and then um, you know, a program that is sort of a beyond reproach. And the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency now, you know, provides uh, anti-doping services for other organizations, such as the, the UFC, you know, the kickboxing organization, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you ask them, they will tell you that one of the reasons that um, Disney just signed a $2 billion contract with them to televise their fights is because they know there's some integrity involved because of the U.S. US Anti-Doping Agency is doing their testing. And right. what does USADA know about kickboxing? Nothing. <laughs> right? But, but uh, uh, I mean, they are human athletes. But I, I think it's, for USADA, it's much more important that there's somebody there who knows how to put the system together. In the bill, why USADA has a majority of the seats on the boards, uh, uh, I believe seven, Six are reserved for industry experts. Now, they can't be active participants in the sense that they still have a financial interest, but they could be retired trainers, uh, you know, retired vets, pe- people who are, you know, know, have, bring a lot of wisdom and knowledge to the, to the game, right, um, but just, you know, no longer have an active financial Aren't interest. Aren't involved right now, I understand. My best candidates for that spot, but they're all passed away. That would be Stan Bergstein, uh, Billy Houghton, Stanley Dancer, Del Miller. They would all be great on that board. Moving on to the uh, next question. Uh, several tracks uh, recently got together to propose rule changes. Why do we need federal legislation? Can't the industry do this themselves internally? Well, the past 20 years, the industry has tried to do this internally. And I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the case of California, every time there's a potential rule change, each of the 38 racing jurisdictions has to approve it. So the National Uniform Medication Program, which was proposed, I think, eight years ago now, there's only five or six states that have implemented all four parts of it, okay? I see. So as a result, it's really hard to implement it. So even, even the changes they came up with, there are 10 separate racing jurisdictions of those tracks involved that are going to have to approve it. And I think you all may remember a few years ago, Kentucky tried to do it for the Breeders' Cup to limit no Lasix for two-year-olds and phasing it out and all that. And the state attorney general uh, knocked it out. So if you don't have sort of enforced uniformity, you're never going to have the uniform rules through all 38 jurisdictions. And most importantly, if all of a sudden there's a new wonder drug out there, like frog juice or whatever it was that was out a few years ago, you can't immediately test it and ban it, right, unless you have a system that can respond quickly. 
I couldn't agree with you more because racing has never been unified where they could actually agree. I think you're 100% correct. And just one add thing to that is that, you know, the Racing Commissioners International, Ed Martin, has always consistently opposed this legislation. And one of the reasons, obviously, is they, they don't want a diminution of their role in racing. But the reality is, on the gambling side, which is why they were put together in the first place, these racing commissioners, that will always be a state-based role, okay? And I'm sure if you get most of these state racing commissioners aside, probably their least fun aspect of what they do, you know, the, 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 the worst part of their job is the doping, because there's never good news, right? Either they're missing a doper, which is bad news, or they're finding one of their friends have doped, and that's bad news too. So taking that out of them is actually, you know, be uh, in the long run way beneficial. If you look at the U.S. Olympic Committee, they grudgingly gave up the anti-doping aspect back in the early 2000s. Back then, the U.S. was considered the, the biggest cheaters in the world. Track and field, swimming, you name it, they were considered the biggest dopers. Okay, so... The USOC knew they had an image problem, and so they decided they got together with the sports federations, and they said, let's give this to an independent body, right? You couldn't pay those guys any amount of money to have them take it back right now. They wouldn't take it back uh -huh. no matter what. And they are so happy uh -huh. to be free of that burden because they were forced. I mean, sports federations were saying, huh, do I have our, our number one star just got caught doping, and we got Olympics coming up. Do we call them out or do we sweep it under the rug? Well, you know what happened, right? That rug's getting big. <laughs> yep, exactly right. <laughs> Moving on to our last question. It's regarding Lasex. Doesn't Lasex help a horse? Why would we want to prohibit it? You know, it's the most perplexing problem in this thing. And the original version of this bill two Congresses ago was silent on Lasix because we didn't want to get bogged down on the issue of Lasix because the bigger issue was having a independent uniform system set up. But as we went on, we realized that the one reason we held out putting in there just wasn't worth it anymore. The horsemen and the Racing Commissioners International just were never going to support the bill whereas there were a lot of people urging us to, to include it. And let me tell you why we should include it. Lasix, uh, at least in thoroughbred horse racing, helps 5% of the horses that run. There are, uh, of only 5% of the horses uh, bleed enough to actually impact and impair their racing. Okay? Yet 95% of all horses, in thoroughbred anyways, uh, use Lasix. So it's over-prescribed. And, and, and one of the reasons they are, you know, want to use Lasix is because they lose, you know, 20 to 30 pounds in water weight when they run. So run, a horse runs lighter, thus faster. And, and you don't, you know, a lot of horsemen don't want to run against a horse that's using Lasix without Lasix because they feel it's a handicap. So there, there's no doubt there are studies have been done that shows that it, Lasix in and of itself is a performance enhancer. Now, does it stop horses from bleeding? Yes. But is it absurd to give 95% of horses a diuretic, which basically, you know, um, you know, withholds, you know, takes out 30 pounds of water uh, for something they don't need? Yes, it's absurd. So, you know, the rest of the racing community, North America is the only racing jurisdiction that allows race day application of Lasix. Uh, and the rest of the world seems to do very well without it. I don't know. I can't say, you know, how much masking it can provide. I'm sure there's some masking. Uh, if a horse is urinating 30 pounds of water, I don't know what else is coming out uh, at that time. So that, that is another concern on it. But I think the, um, you know, just the fact we, we, we really don't know how, you know, it's been impacting the breed when you dehydrate a horse before a race and you've got to give it three weeks of electrolyte treatments just to get them back to normal. You need the electrolytes after that. You're right about that. And it right. does mask a lot of the drugs. That's why a lot of guys use it. Most of these horses don't bleed. They bleed during the very cold racing season where the capillaries in the throat explode when the cold air is being sucked into their trachea. The capillaries wind up bleeding and the Lasix seems to control that because we have horses scoped right after a race a lot of times to see if they're bleeding to see why they did not perform well. Usually that's the case. Our point is, you know, um, you know, the, the, they're, they're doing this great in Japan and Europe where there's cold racing and other places without 
the benefit of LASIKs and race day. There's got to be other ways to go about this without using it. And let, let me tell you one other aspect that this is important to raise. A lot of horsemen will raise the issue of added cost of, of, of better testing. Right now there was a McKinsey study that showed it, it would probably cost, at least in the thoroughbred world, $40 per horse per start extra. Okay? Now if you think about, you think about what it would cost to give a horse a shot of Lasix, and then what it costs for electrolyte treatments afterwards. Um, and some of these horses are getting, you know, they're getting those shots while they're training too. Uh, it's going to it's going to add up way more than forty dollars per horse. So absolutely, I think there's going to be significant savings for uh, uh, you know trainers um, and ultimately owners. And the last thing I'm saying as a as a minor owner myself in thoroughbred horse racing, I know one thing that the trainers. There's not one thing they don't pass off to the owners. <laughs> Every you know, I, I, I have the solution for you for financing. Put a 10% vet tax on there. Charge the vets 10%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we leave it all up to, in the bill. We leave it all up to the states to decide how they want to cover the costs of, um, you know, racing. Listen, you know, there's some jurisdictions that the Delta... Uh, from their testing to get to adequate testing is going to be steep and others are going to be minor. And we leave it up to states how they are going to, you know, make up that delta. Um, and, you know, it could be, you know, it could be from a number of th- ways to do it. So uh, we don't presume to tell the states how to do it. We just say they have to do it. Yeah, I, I think New York charges like uh, $19 per start for testing. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the, that's across the board for thoroughbreds and harness horses. I'm yeah. not 100% sure on that. But Bob, the only thing I was going to say is when you're talking about Lasix uh, making horses run faster, I don't really think that it makes horses run faster. What it does, like I believe EPO does the same thing, it allows them to maintain top speed longer. And that's really the key to what this mm-hmm. scenario has always been. Because most races, when you really analyze it, you got a fast quarter and a slower quarter, and then another slower quarter and then a fast quarter. Mm-hmm. But if you could go at your top speed longer, you certainly have an edge. Right. So I guess I'm going to start to close it out now. Uh, thank you, Sean, for being on the show. My and pleasure. I, I do think that Trade has a question for you regarding Friday's event. Okay. Yes, I do. But listen, Sean, one thing. I wanted to ask you this, and uh, I don't want to get too long-winded with it because we are kind of over time. The producer is waving his hand to me, uh, and <laughs> and uh, she's right here, and she told me we're way over time. But we may have to break this up into two two different shows. But listen, let me ask you this. Are you familiar with the EPO test that they send out to China, and it costs about 600 bucks to check for EPO because America does not have a EPO test, actually. They can only test for antibodies when you use EPO. I think develop. there's an EPO test for humans, though, isn't there? I think USADA has one. I think there is a UPO t- uh, an EPO yeah. test for humans because that's what it was used on. It was used on cancer patients originally. Right. The reason I know a little bit about this, I've never used EPO myself as a trainer, but my brother and I, my brother's a toxicologist, and we looked into this because I had heard about EPO eight or nine years ago. I had him look into it with me. And the EPO, after you use Lasix with EPO, it coagulates the blood and sometimes it causes a clot to go to the brain and that's how wow. some of these horses drop on the track. That's some of the things I've found out. Now, I can't substantiate this, but that's what I've heard. You know? Interesting. But the test for EPO that I know that Adelson uses... I think it's Adelson. Isn't it Freddie at the Meadowlands? Adelson, the uh, guy yes. that owns the Meadowlands? Yeah. He, he does. He'll pick out a trainer that he believes is using EPO, and he'll have the horses tested. And they send it to China, and it costs 600 bucks to test that horse. I have not heard about that. I'd like to learn more about it. Sean, that's uh, Jeff Garrow's track in Meadowlands. Yeah, Je- Jeff's an active member of our coalition. Sean, tell us a little bit about this event you have on Friday. The coalition and some of its members are going to get together and um, uh, have a luncheon uh, event for uh, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. She is the chairwoman of the subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House that has jurisdiction over our issue. 
and the Horse Racing Integrity Act is before her committee. So uh, we hope to have a great and lively discussion with her. Our goal is to obviously get a hearing and a markup in that committee uh, sometime soon. And if anybody is in the D.C. area uh, and wants to come by, um, you know, have, have them contact me. Okay, good enough. We will do Thank that. you very much, Sean. You're very informative, and we appreciate you being with us. Uh, pleasure being on. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you, Sean. You're a great guest. We're going to close it out now, and thank you to all our listeners. And on next week's show, more topics on race and integrity. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Don't forget to check out Bob Marks' book, Wave Life. And next week, we'll begin our weekly updates of the Standard Bread Retirement Association. And we'll see you next time. Take it home, Jimmy. The Harness Racing Alumni Show 